the icons of real estate podcast. Are you ready to learn the proven money-making secrets from top producing icon agents? Ready to skyrocket your business? This podcast is for you. Tune in every week with your host, Tomasz Fonseca, and find out how to implement proven strategies to 10 times your business. From $3 million to $30 million in just 12 months. Brought to you by the Masters in Real Estate Marketing, Arter SEO. Welcome to Icons of Real Estate. I'm your host, Patty Teal. Today's guest is Mike Simmons. Mike is the owner of a successful real estate investing company, lending company, and a partner in one of the country's largest mentorship mastermind companies. He's a busy guy. He is also the producer and host of his own online show, Just Start Real Estate, interviewing entrepreneurs who run six, seven, and eight figure businesses. Welcome, Mike. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. You wear a lot of hats. I do. I do wear a lot of hats. This is a man who worked uh, for corporate America for a couple of decades and definitely doesn't want to go back. And so I make sure there's enough streams of income and success coming in that I never have to think about that again. Oh, good for you. Congratulations on that. So I, that's what we're going to start with is your journey and how you got to where you are. So I'm going to turn it over to you and just hear a little bit about your path, maybe starting uh, as a corporate worker or even before, wherever you'd like. Yeah, for sure. I'll go briefly back into the because it kind of matters where I come from even farther back than my my working life. So I was uh, raised in the Midwest, Michigan, uh, still here. Uh, my dad was a Marine. That was pretty, pretty important in my in my life. Um, not all for the greatest of reasons. Oh. I struggled a little bit. He was he was a Marine. He was a, a Marine uh, in every sense of the word. And it was a, it was it was tough on us, and so we had a lot of discipline in my family, and and but there were no entrepreneurs. There was nobody telling me that there was another way other than going to school, going to college, or not, uh, but working in in the automotive industry, working in a union. Like that was really the goal for my parents, for me, right? That's right, what they wanted me right. to do. And without you know, with the absence of anybody to tell me anything different, that's kind of the direct the direction that I went. And uh, you know, I fast forward. I'm in I'm in the automotive industry. I actually went to college as uh, an adult married with a full-time job. In other words, I went back to college. I didn't go right <laughs> out of high school. Gotcha. Um, there was a there was a downturn in the, around 2000, right? We had a lot of a lot of issues in in the uh, in the world and the automotive industry really took a, a huge hit back around 2000. Mm -hmm. And it became apparent to me that I wasn't really in a great position in the in, in the world because I didn't have a college education. I was working in the automotive industry and I was a, quite a commodity. Like I, I, there was nothing about me that made me stand out. I didn't have a lot of experience and I had no education. So I went back to school, did that whole thing, kind of got on the track that I wanted to be on, started working for a multinational company. I thought everything was great. And and I'll kind of like take you to a, a pivotal moment for me where everything sort of changed in my life. I was working uh, on a Friday. It was 8 p.m. I had worked late every single night that week. Kids at home, wife at home, mm -hmm. um, very stressed out. And I was working with a client, uh, one of the big three automakers, uh, rhymes with Blord, Blord. <laughs> Uh, and and it wasn't it wasn't a fun experience. I was working, and there were some things going wrong in, in a project that we were working on for them. And uh, the the client uh, at one point around eight p.m. asked me why we were struggling with this project. What was going on? Why are we late? Why are we not hitting our deliverables? And I told him why. I just gave him an honest assessment of what was going on. Mm -hmm. And he he got right in my face and called me a liar and oh. was basically dressed me down, screaming at me. And it's mm -hmm. and so it's eight o'clock at night, and I just you know after he was done, I was polite. I was I was professional. I walked to my over to my manager who was there also, and I said. What are we doing here? Why? Why are we here? What, what is? What is happening right now? Like we're being screamed at. We're doing our best. It's eight o'clock. It's Friday night. We've been working late all week. No one's seen their family. Like, what are we doing? And he said, "You need to get your your priorities straight." And I said, "You know what? You're right." And from that point forward, I started taking my side hustle, which was real estate at the time. I was sort of doing it after hours on the weekends, kind of a hobbyist. 
And I started making that a huge focus for me. And I decided my priorities were going to get straight and they were going to be my family, my kids, and having an, an income and a, and, a, and a career that allows me to be at home at a, at a reasonable time or be around for my kids' activities. And so from that point forward, I really started focusing on real estate. And I was able to, within 12 months, not only quit my job, but my company that was sort of young at that point, uh, we did a million dollars in gross profit that year, that first 12 months that I started focusing on it and left my job and never looked back. And, and ironically, that first year, the first 12 months where I really started focusing, we did a million dollars in net, and I'm sorry, in gross profits. And a million dollars was ironically what I had made over the course of a 25 year career in automotive, right? So I started off not making a lot of money. Obviously, mm -hmm. I was making like $25,000 a year. And by the time I was done, I was making a good living. But if you just averaged all those years together, you know, times 25 is a million dollars. So it was a no brainer to me. And, and I was hooked. And like I said, I, you know, I think people like Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, like, why do they keep working, innovating, building, growing? Why do they keep doing that? They're, they're, they're hundred millionaires or billionaires. Why would they do it? And it's because first of all, they love it. But I think second of all, those guys are driven by the fear of what they have or the life that they created or whatever it is like going away. Like I, I do believe that a lot of successful people are at least partially fueled by the fear of having to go back to a life that they don't want to be in. And so that honestly does fuel me. I'm fueled very much by not going back to that life and getting screamed at at eight o'clock at night for something that, you know, is, isn't necessarily my fault. So, um, that's what I do. That's why I wear a lot of hats. I just don't, I don't want to go back to that. I, I, my worst day as an entrepreneur is better than my best day working in the automotive industry. I absolutely love your story. And I know our audience is going to love it too. I do have one question about it. When that person yeah. said you need to get your priorities straight, were yeah. they trying to tell you you need to get your business, that business comes first and your work comes first? Yes. Or were they he, really telling you? Yeah, that because I was complaining that we were there at eight o'clock at night on a Friday. Right. We've been there till eight o'clock every night. And he essentially was telling me the fact that you don't think you should be here means you don't have your priority straight, right? Gotcha. So what he yeah. meant and the way I took it were two different things. I know what right. he meant, mm -hmm. but but he but he lit something in me because he was right. When he said you have to get your priorities straight, I thought, what are my priorities? It's it's my yes. family. It's not it's not this place. This place will be here after I'm gone. They were here before I got here. They don't need me here. This isn't my priority. My my family needs me to be around. And so you know, I, I'm big on bedtime. Like I like putting my kids to bed. It's a Aww, great time of the day yeah. and, and it's a great time to bond with your kids. And, you know, they finally have settled down. And honestly, when kids are little, most times they don't want to go to bed. And so bedtime is when they'll start talking and they'll start sharing the because truth. they're, mm -hmm. they're stalling, you know, but there's, yeah. but still it's, it's a great time to kind of bond and, and, and listen to your kids and hear what they have to say. So anyways, it was a big thing for me. And I was really, really, it was depressing for me to be in that situation. So I had to get out of it and I worked my butt off. But I'll tell you, it, doing what I did that first year was really hard because I was working full time and building this business. Oh, but mm -hmm. at the end of at the end of the year, when I left my my company, the company I was working for, it was really like I had arrived home. Like I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to be doing for the first time. So it was really great. As I, I liken it to if you're you know kind of underwater, somebody's holding your head underwater and then you finally come up for air, how like that, that oxygen filling your lungs, like how that feels. That's how I felt, honestly, after that first year. I was like, this is what I was meant to do. So it was a great feeling. And, and yeah, I, I cannot imagine myself, you know, 20 years ago thinking what I, how I live now and what I do. It's the greatest. I would never even have dreamed it. I'm so happy for you. I really, I'm so Thank you. Impressed and happy. I think that's the best part of my job is hearing these inspirational success stories. It's just awesome. I know you also wrote a book called Level Jumping, How I Grew My Business to Over 1 Million in 12 Months. So yep. you told us you did it. You worked really hard, <laughs> yeah. but how did you do it? <laughs> you know, it's funny how I did it. I, I So this was like one of those overnight success stories that takes, you know, six years. Um, I started real estate uh investing in 2008 okay. and I didn't 
hit that 1 million mark until 2015. And so there were a lot of years in there where I was kind of doing it as a side hobby. Uh, I was I was kind of bouncing around trying to figure things out on my own. And I, what I always say is I was running my business very much like kids run a lemonade stand at the end of their driveway. Like no processes, no, I, no plan, no accounting. You know what I mean? We're just, right. I was just collecting money and spending mm -hmm. money. And I, it was just, it was completely ridiculous, but I didn't know how to do it. I, I don't have any entrepreneurs in my life. Everybody I know is an automotive worker in a union. That's what they know. Mm -hmm. And so I, I didn't know where to go. Um, it wasn't until I, I, asked for and looked for help from mentors and coaches, people who had already achieved what I wanted to achieve and where I wanted to be and started asking them questions and putting myself in the right rooms in front of the right people and just kind of looking for someone who could who could show me the way. And once I did, literally, I have a graph that I've shown when I've presented on stage where you look at the growth of my company from 2008 to 2014, and it's very, it's almost flat. It's like minimal mm -hmm. growth, like almost nothing. Right. And then all of a sudden there's like this hockey stick moment where it just, oh. it skyrockets. And, and so people obviously, and, and rightfully ask what happened right there. That right. is where I started getting help. That's where I hired oh. coaches and mentors to help me. And a, a phrase that I've kind of come up with for this is I, I was able to, when I found these coaches and mentors, I was able to use their hindsight, right? Because they mm -hmm. say hindsight's 2020 20, as my foresight. And so whenever you can use someone's clear 2020 hindsight as your vision for the future, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it makes things so much easier. And so, you know, hiring coaches and mentors allowed me to not only buy speed, but it, it's like you're buying a map to where all of the landmines are that you're about to walk into this landmine field, but someone gives you a map and says, these are where all the pitfalls are that I found. And you can avoid all of that, right? So you can avoid easily avoidable mistakes. It's not that you're not going to make mistakes, but you're not going to repeat obvious mistakes that people have you know, found and, and can point out to you very simply. So I found um, a, a guy who is a good friend of mine now, mm -hmm. uh, but he had built a business and he was probably five to six years ahead of me where where he was in his journey and so he was able to kind of look back and say this is what i've done over the last five years this is this is how i went from where you are right now to where i am and he was where i wanted to be mm -hmm. and i said his name is andy i said listen Andy, if you did that you know over the last five years and, and you were figuring it out organically making mistakes two steps forward one step back kind of a thing shouldn't I be able to accelerate what you did if I already know the playbook? And he's like, yeah, you, you definitely could. And so I did, I went, I went those, that five-year journey, I made it in 12 months. But the reason I'm kind of going to go back now, the reason I, I wanted to explain quickly that I was raised by a Marine is because in my house growing up, procrastination, not acceptable. Being afraid oh. to do something, not acceptable. If something needed to be done, it was going to get done right now. And so I learned those lessons. And so when Andy would say, hey, I did X, Y, and Z to get myself to the next level, I did it. I didn't question it. I didn't second guess it. I didn't make excuses because excuses were not really acceptable in my family either. I just took action, like crazy mm -hmm. action, like very, very like aggressive action. And that's really how I did it. That is amazing. Um, most Marines that I know too are super organized. Is that a part of it as well? Yeah, very organized, very systematic. Um, you know, kind of like you you put your head down and you go. And you know, the big thing I think what really stop. I, I don't know. I'm not incredibly smart. I was an average student. I was an average athlete in high school. Um, but what I have found the common denominator of successful people, like I, I've met people in real estate that were like genuinely brilliant, like just smart, and and I've met people that were not brilliant right they weren't dumb they just academically they weren't special right they mm -hmm. were just average and, and it and it doesn't I, I haven't seen a correlation between brilliant academically and successful in business i i don't think there's a, a strain a big correlation there i think the correlation that i see or the common thread that's woven through everybody i've met that's been successful in anything specifically real estate is that they take action. They don't make excuses. They don't blame mm -hmm. outside forces on their struggles or their challenges. They accept everything as their responsibility and they don't make excuses and they take action. And when something doesn't go right, they course correct and they take action. 
that's really the biggest thing. People are held back by fear, I think. Mm-hmm. So some people, it's fear of losing money, right? That's that's a realistic and, and reasonable mm-hmm. thing to be concerned about. Some people are more afraid of of like reputation, like looking stupid for lack of a better way sure. of saying it. Yeah. And that really was what held me back originally because I said I, I started real estate in 2008. But what I didn't say was I decided that real estate was my vehicle in 2003. Mm-hmm. So it took me five years to even just get the courage to get started. And, and you know, I was growing it out of the house, but I still had my dad's voice in my head for those five years. And I just got to the point where I couldn't even stand to look at myself. I was sick of being afraid and paralyzed by the fear of the unknown or fear of messing up or the fear of looking dumb. And I, I finally took action. And, and that was huge for me because taking action is absolutely the number one thing to do when you're trying to do anything, right? Just take action. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, I want to comment on you think you're an average student or you were an average student. I interview so many successful people, so I totally agree with you that school was not their thing. And there's all kinds of intelligence. And I used to be a school teacher. So I, you know, it's just not. <laughs> My wife is too. My wife yes, was a school teacher. Yeah. Yes. So I think you're very smart to be able to do this. It may <laughs> just be a different kind of smart. So um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And your story is so inspirational. And so uh, your name, you said of the, your businesses, your podcast and different things. Um, just start real estate with Mike Simmons. That's the name of your podcast. So that yep. is uh, talks really about what you're talking about. You know, don't yeah. put it off. You made up your mind. You can do it. Go. Yeah. You know, I used to, I, I still do, but I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and it's not just real estate. I listen to a lot of business stuff and just people who are inspire me and successful people and all kinds of, of things. And uh, before I started my podcast, I was just avid, you know, I was just consuming and I would listen to these people that I admire. And at the end of the podcast interview, a lot of hosts will say, do you have any parting words? Do you have any last thoughts? Do you have any advice? You know, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, these people that I really admired, you know, nine times out of 10, their advice would be some version of just start. Quit thinking about it. Quit planning. Quit scheming. Just start. You know, and so it just occurred to me that that's that's really the the big thing. That's if that's the one thing that successful people want to tell someone at the end of this long interview of all this great stuff that they shared. If the one thing they want to leave people with is just start, then that's the perfect that's the perfect name for my show. Oh, great takeaway. So, um, if somebody is listening and they're very inspired, of course you would be a wonderful coach. But how does one even choose a coach in the first place? Yeah, it's a great question. And and here's the sad truth. And I know this, uh, being a coach in, in the industry, they're they're not all the same. And and some of them just aren't that good, right? Um so I think what you have to do, a referral is great. If there's someone who's being coached that you know and you trust, and they say, Hey, this person really helped me, or this group is really, really great, that's a good place to start. What I did was I was listening and, like I said, consuming a lot. Mm -hmm. And the people that really resonated with me, that their coaching style or the way that they kind of passed along information resonated with me, that's who I gravitated toward and tried. But the reality is I've heard so many stories of people who have hired coaches or mentors or joined a mastermind, and it just wasn't great. And, and they don't feel like they got their money's worth. And so there's a little bit of a leap of faith. Uh, but I think just like you do when you're buying a house in real mm-hmm. estate, you have to do your due diligence. You need to try to find people who have been a part of that, get them, you know, ask them questions, ask if you can have referrals from the people running it and just pay attention, get in their world. Most coaches, most mentors have um content that's just distributed freely like absorb that like really get into that stuff and see if their style of communication their style of coaching works for you it doesn't everybody doesn't resonate with everybody right there are people Mm -hmm. i'm sure there are people that just don't resonate with me the way i coach the way i teach the way i talk the way i conduct myself it just doesn't vibe with them and that's Mm -hmm. fine they should Mm -hmm. find someone that they really feel comfortable with but i think once you do find that person and you feel comfortable with them and you ask them for help the key is stop looking for more help use that information like don't always be a what else what else kind of a person right um i I used to do this i did it for that five years that i was sort of stuck is i would read a book and i would be like that is great that is so great i'm so inspired and i'd go get another book 
And then I'd go get another book and then I'd Mm -hmm. listen to a different podcast. And it's like, at some point you kind of have to put your eggs in one basket and really like use that information and go for it and see what happens. Wow. That's such great advice. I get tend to be a person who gets a lot of advice from a lot of places too. But I think at some point you pick the one that you want to work with and you really follow their advice. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, You really have to, because otherwise you're just kind of doing the shiny object thing and and you're not, you know, what most people need is not more information. Mm -hmm. They need more action. And so most people, you know, I'm a big fan. If you're trying to go from A to Z, you don't have to understand everything it takes to go from A to Z. You have to know how to get from A to B. And then when you're on B, you have to know how to get to C, right? Mm -hmm. That's really, Mm -hmm. I think, because there's something that I, I talk about a lot and it's called the law of diminishing intent. And just to kind of, and I, I can't even credit it. I, I didn't make this up, I, I heard it somewhere. But um, essentially what it says is, the longer the time, when you get inspired by something, whether it's a book, a podcast, a speech, a whatever, presentation, somebody, you get inspired, you have this moment where you're inspired to do something. The more time that elapses between being inspired and actually doing that thing, the less chance you're actually going to do it right so the law of diminishing intent says when when you're inspired when you're on that high of of you really want to do something the sooner you actually take action toward that the more likely you are to succeed and actually go toward that the longer you put it off the more likely you'll never do it so i just say when you find someone who inspires you when you find someone who you believe has the answers that you're looking for you need to take action don't look for more answers you know if someone gives you an answer then then take it and go for it if you believe that they can truly really help you so it's sounding like a lot of your coaching is not just the technical part of it you really help people to feel confident and inspired and to take action is that correct i have to yeah i do and i and i don't don't get me wrong i know that I know that there's a technical aspect of course, to, yeah. to learning and growing and building a business. I, I totally do. But I'll tell you what, I have given essentially the same tools to two different people of equal skill set, equal ability, you know, no real advantage. They're kind of the same. I give them both the same set of tools and one of them builds a successful business and the other one doesn't. And it's not the tools and it's not even the person's ability. Sometimes it's what's going on between their ears that they need help with. And so I think any any good coach, mentor, group, whatever it is, there has to be some level of you know, accountability, of really just kind of developing that why and it sounds a little fluffy and people tend to want to no nah, just tell me the software you use just tell me give me a spreadsheet that'll give me some answers and and those are important but some of those intangibles if if they're not if they're not set up if they're not clear to the person they won't succeed i could give them all the information in the world they they won't do it because they don't believe it or they have these limiting beliefs that they have to get past so it has to be part of it and i i love that part of it i i was actually uh in a conversation with brandon turner who used to be the, the host of bigger pockets and uh he said he said to be honest with you mindset has way more to do with success than anything else and i, I couldn't agree with him more but it's like kids when you want them to eat vegetables or when you want them to take medicine sometimes you have to disguise it with other things <laughs> um, you know maybe blend it up into a smoothie or like you know put mm-hmm. jelly around the pill and they'll take mm-hmm. it like sometimes that's how you have to coach and mentor you have to give them what they think they want mm-hmm. along with what you know they need and and so that is part of it that is great and is accountability a part of it too they know that you're going to ask them, what have you gotten done? Or have you taken these steps? Yeah. Is that a part of it too? Yep. Accountability is huge. I, I do think that there's an, an actual whole business. Like, honestly, I think if somebody wanted to start a business around accountability and say, I don't care what industry you're in, but my business is accountability. You tell me what you're going to do and I'll hold you accountable. I think a lot of people would would join that company or they would join that service because I think a lot of people, they, they lack the accountability. They need someone to tell them, hey, you said you were gonna do this, what happened? Why didn't you do it? Like, what is your plan for recovery? So yeah, accountability definitely has to be part of it. Not everybody needs it the same and some people don't need it at all, but a lot of people do. So yeah, I, you definitely have to have that part of it. 
Well, don't be surprised if uh, an accountability.com business doesn't start. <laughs> I tell you what, I, I think it would do well. I, honestly, I, I'm part of it, like you read in the beginning, I'm part of a mastermind. It's, it's a humongous mastermind. And we didn't, use, we didn't have accountability as part of that program for a long time. We added it. And it's the reason why a ton of people stay in the program mm -hmm. strictly for the accountability. I, I know it's super necessary. I, I'm one of the people that I, I doesn't need it as badly because I sort of have this motor and I have this like this, you know, this this uh, upbringing that just forces me to be accountable. I'm harder on myself than any accountability person mm -hmm. could be. Mm -hmm. And so I don't need it as much, but a lot of people do need it. And so I think it's right. a huge component for anybody to do anything. Right. And then you talked about the shiny object syndrome. I call it the hummingbird. You know, sometimes people can get going so many directions. And so I would imagine with a coach yeah. like yourself, it'd be really helpful to have them target what they're really or focus what they totally. need to do. Mm -hmm. Yep. A hundred percent. People, people definitely need that. Most people do need that. And I think it's, it's important to have it as any part of a coaching program. So I can imagine people listening and being very interested in your coaching. Do you take beginners as well as people have been in the business for a long time. How does that work? I do. Um, I, and I've had a lot of experience coaching and mentoring both uh, very experienced high level investors to kind of take their business to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really my book that you referenced. It's it's probably a better handbook or better playbook for experienced investors. Okay. There's definitely lessons in there that a new investor can take with them and sort of put in their tool belt for when the time comes. Mm -hmm. But that book is really how I took a small business and grew it into a big business. Um, but yeah, I love working with with experienced investors because they don't have it's not the fundamentals that they're struggling with. It's how to take that business that they've built because most people learn how to build their business, you know. Uh, they're a, a one a one person operation or a solopreneur or whatever you want to call them and they learn how to do everything to grow their business to a point but everybody mm -hmm. has the same amount of time in the day but it's still finite right mm -hmm. there's still only so much a person can do and so to take that business to the next level what people don't realize sometimes is you learn like in real estate you learn how to market maybe you learn how to talk to sellers you learn how to talk to buyers you learn how to raise money you learn all these skills but then when you want to go from maybe a half million or a million dollar company to a 10 million dollar company you're not the one doing those things you're you have to hire people you have to put a team together and you have to train them inspire them and lead them to do the things that you're really really good at but training leading and inspiring and hiring is a much different skill set than doing. And so that's sort of uh, what I can help people do at that level. But in the beginning level, for sure, I, you know, I started so, I wasted so many years doing it wrong for so long that I definitely can shortcut that learning curve. And I can take, I can take like lessons learned from a seven figure business that I, uh, that I grew and run and help someone who's new put it together right from the beginning. Because again, the story that I don't tell as often is yes, I went from basically this, tiny little company to a company doing million dollars in profits. But in doing so, so fast, I actually had to turn over my whole team and rebuild my company in that seven figure world. So it's like I, I built this rocket and launched it. And once I was in orbit, it started falling apart because it had been put together too quickly. And so oh. I'm try, I try to help people avoid that, right? I, I grew fast, which is a really mm -hmm. sexy, fun thing to say. But what is not as exciting is the fact that I, I put it together with the wrong people, with the wrong processes, and I got there, but I had to retool on the fly. And, and I don't want people to have to do that. So let's build it right from the beginning and let's build something that doesn't cause you to go from working nine to five for somebody else to working from nine to nine for yourself, right? We don't wanna create this really high paying, stressful job that you've created for yourself. We wanna create a business. And I referenced that lemonade stand at the end of the driveway. That's not what you want to build. You want to build a company that has a team that runs like we're talking right now. Mm -hmm. Right now, my company is buying and selling houses right now as we're talking and I don't know the addresses. Mm -hmm. I'm not negotiating anything. It's happening because I built a team and I built a company that runs without me. It's happening. I love that. Yeah. And it must be so inspiring for people that are experienced. They have a little business, but they want to take it to the next level, but they don't really know how to do it. And you can kind of look at it with a different lens and just help them create a plan. 
Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's sort of like, you know, I, I'm not a mechanic. I'm not a car guy, uh, even though I worked in the automotive industry for years. But, you know, it's like you take your car to a mechanic and you go, yeah, it's making this noise. I'm not really sure something's wrong. And they listen to it for a minute and they go, oh, yeah, it's this. And they just do some tweaks and they and you're on your way. Like, that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm looking at their business. If they have a small business and we're going to evaluate what's going on and we're going to diagnose the problem or the, the issues or things that could be improved. And we're going to go from there and let them build something bigger. Wow, that's really great. So are there one-on-one -on -one coaching opportunities that you yep. offer? Are they groups? What? Get into the nitty gritty yeah. a little of what you offer. So I have done some group stuff and I'll do that again in the future, but ongoing at any time, you can go to my website, mikesimmons.com and click on the coaching tab. And I offer right now uh, on an ongoing basis, I'm offering two things. One is a more of a quick start coaching program. It's six sessions over a 90 day period to kind of really kind of get you going fast and really diagnose what's happening and get you going quickly. The other thing is called a, a quarterly executive um, meeting. And so we meet quarterly and this is probably better for companies that are a little bit established or have a little bit of, of an experience and track record. We meet quarterly to go over your quarterly goals, right? There's some accountability there. There's some planning. Uh, we look at their KPIs. We look at their numbers and figure out where they need to, to focus for the next 90 days. And every 90 days we meet and have this, like basically it's a it's a partner meeting or an executive meeting, whatever you wanna look at it as, except they don't have to give me any equity, right? <laughs> they don't yeah. have to share their company with me, but I'll sit down with them uh, every quarter and we'll kind of go over everything and make sure they're on track. Wow, that's great. So, um, gosh, you do so many things. It's really, really fascinating. Um, have some of your clients just really exploded their businesses after uh, getting the coaching from you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I have clients that have grown their business to much larger than mine. Like <laughs> we have people that have wow. some explosive growth. Definitely. I, I, there's no doubt about it. The cool thing is if someone comes to me with a business that has a little bit of track record or they've, they've kind of done some things, their struggles and what they're going through, it's not unique. It, it may feel unique to them because sure. no mm -hmm. one's ever shared with them, but I've heard it so many times and the solutions are, they're not necessarily one size fits all. I don't want to say that. That sounds a little bit generic, but they're not entirely unique. Their, their challenges, I've heard it before and they may have some unique circumstances here and there, but I've, I have fixed the problem in the past. And if they're brand new building the business, it's, it's really quite formulaic to a point, right? There's definitely, this is how everyone should really do it when they're starting off. And then the great thing about business is, and what I tell people is you, you get, you can't, you can't steer a parked car. And so you have to get moving in a direction. And once your business starts moving, now we can steer. Now we can see what's going right, what's going wrong, and we can make adjustments. It's very hard to make adjustments on something that hasn't started, right? So you have to start. And so I help them get started and then we make those adjustments. And if they're new and they take like the 90 day kind of a quick start mentor program, mm -hmm. we can really get them off and running quickly in 90 days. The program, I used to be a part of a program. It was a, it was a 90 day program program. And, and I've had some of my greatest successes from people who were just working with me for 90 days. They didn't need to be with me for five years. They just needed a quick 90 day intensive. We're going to talk all the time. We're going to go over everything. We can course correct really, really quickly and get you going in the right direction. Part of this is momentum and direction, right? Once someone knows what to do fundamentally and they're going in the right direction, it's a matter of holding onto the steering wheel and keeping it going in that direction. Great. And do you offer consulting as well? Is it different than coaching when you're working with some of these businesses or are they one and the same? Uh, they're one and the same for me. I, I guess I, I believe that uh, consulting can be different than coaching for sure. So I don't think mm -hmm. I do, I don't do traditional consulting where I go in for like a day, like a whole, to me, consulting is you go in for a whole day or you go for a week somewhere to some business and you kind of look at things and give them, you give them some direction, and you get out, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't do it that way. I, I typically do more coaching sessions over some period of time. I think it's just, it's more effective because even if I sat in someone's business, I sat in their office for a week, they're going to have questions when I leave. I know that they are. Sure. And so I would rather spread out like the, the time that we have together, kind of shorter bursts spread out over time because I've just done this long enough to know. I can talk till I'm blue in the face. I guarantee as soon as I leave you, the next day you'll have a question because I've done that. I've done it where I sat down with someone for a whole day and mapped out their business for the next six months. A week later, 
they have a hundred questions, right? So I might as well not spend, I might as well not spend a whole day because you know how it goes. You were a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. When you talk to a classroom, like how much of what you say do they retain? A hundred percent of what you tell them? I'm sure not. No, or probably not even close, right? It's not even close. close, It's like we have our brains just can't absorb and take everything in a hundred percent. So I, I, it's almost like a law of dimin- or it's like um, diminishing returns. When you talk to someone for a whole day, at some point they just can't take any more in. Right. And so mm-hmm. they don't hear it. So anyways, it's a really long, really long answer to a very short question. But. <laughs> That's okay. So uh, you do a lot to get the word out. You have a podcast, you've written a book. Are there other ways that people find out about you? Um, the, probably the biggest other way is this, right? Talking on other people's shows and being interviewed and, and kind of spreading the word that way, um, which is really kind of my favorite way to do it, to be honest. Like you, you, someone can come to my podcast and over time they can decide whether or not I resonate with them or they like what I say, or they, they kind of like me in general. Um, but it's like my show. And so I, I'm, I, it's hard. It's in other words, if I say that you're great, that holds more weight than you saying you're great, right? So, <laughs> uh, and so I would rather go on other people's shows and kind of like talk to them and 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 be able to really talk about what I do and and how I can help people. It just it makes it makes things, I don't know, more authentic. I think. Yeah, and you're such a good speaker. And you mentioned you also do speaking engagements. Yeah, I do actually a lot. I I, I do this kind of stuff quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I I speak on stage several times a year. I'm, I'm, there's an event coming up actually. It's called Seven. Uh, it's called Flip Hacking Live, and it's put on by the Seven Figure Flipping Group. Uh, that'll be in Orlando. It'll be probably a thousand to twelve hundred people. Uh, I speak at that every year, uh, along mm-hmm. with some smaller some smaller stages throughout the year. Well, you wear many hats, as we said in the introduction, and you also. Um, are associated or have a lending company and um yeah a real estate investing company i don't know how much yeah. time we have I mean, you want to talk all, about either of those i mean it's all integrated right i mean it's all related it's not like i'm a doctor and an electrician and i also build cars you know it's like that would be sort of crazy and, and hard to do um wh- what i found when i started real estate in 2008 there was a common challenge that everyone had and it's where can I find money for my deals, right? That was sort of like the the title of of the problem. Fast forward to 2022 and I talked to hundreds of investors every year, hundreds and hundreds. Guess what one of the biggest challenges are for investors in 2022? I need to find money for my deals. And so it occurred to me about a year and a half ago that this problem is never going to go away and and I've been doing this a long time and it was a real natural kind of a progression and evolution for me was to start a lending company to find and give people a place to go to get money for their deals, but not just money for the deals because there's literally hundreds of companies that will lend you money for deals, right? It's really not a problem. It's a perceived problem. Mm-hmm. It's not a problem. And this is a good example of mindset over like real technical issue. <laughs> there's so much money out there that people want to lend to us as real estate investors, and but people don't know where to go. And so they just think it's not out there, but it is. But my my goal was more than just to have the money to lend, because like I said, a lot of companies have that. Mm-hmm. As an investor, for me, I know that my time, especially as I get older, my time means more to me than anything, including money. And so I wanted to not just build another lending company. I want to build a lending company that's built for people who are like me, who will pay for convenience and they want to eliminate all the hassles and hurdles and any sort of like things that's put in front of them. In other words, you you go to a lending company, they lend you money and they're going to have 15 forms to fill out and you're going to have to talk to some, you know, underwriter five times and you're going to get to closing and there's going to be an issue. I want a lending company that is just incredibly simple, right? We have a simple interest rate. There are no other fees. There's no doc fees. There's no origination fees. There's no wire fees. There's no questions. It's just, we, you have the loan and it's like just so simple. And I just wanted, and it's very concierge driven. Like in other words, we, we take on all of the lifting and all you really have to do is sign your name and show up at the closing and you'll get your money. Like I just wanted to make it that simple because I know me working with lending companies, myself, my company, I have been frustrated beyond belief at the number of hoops that I had to jump through mm-hmm. for a loan. I mean, just incredible hoops that I had to jump through. And I just said, what if I could eliminate all of those hoops and make this just like the most pleasant, simple, straightforward process? 
what would happen? And what's happened is I, 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 I turned down more loans than I can, I can even tell you. Like there's so much demand that raising money for my company is probably my number one focus right now is raising money to lend because there's just a, a huge demand because once someone works with me, they say it's, it's the easiest loan process they've ever been through. So that's the, that's the goal. Well, that's, that's a wonderful convenience. And in the long run, even though they pay for the services of having a convenient way to do it, you probably save the money. I save them a ton of money because the reality is my rates are very competitive. They're right in basically in the middle of everybody else, right? They're not the lowest. They're not the highest. They're mm -hmm. very much in the middle, but I know that I eliminate 90% of the hassles that they that they experience going to other people. So that's my goal because I know me as an investor, if you eliminate hassles, I will use you. I will use your service if it's hassle free. That's all I really care about because like you said, I have a lot of hats, right? I'm doing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I can't be bogged down by some no. crazy bureaucratic process that I, I just can't deal with it. I don't have time for that. So yeah. anybody who can streamline my life, I, I work with. Oh yeah. Uh, on that note, anybody that can streamline your life, do you have a really great team that helps you? I, I do hundred percent. Everything I do is a team and process mm -hmm. because here's the, here's the reality. I, I'm very much a fan of personality assessments like the disc and the Colby. And there's another one called the culture index that I use. I'm very much a fan of those and I've taken all of those tests and all of them have told me emphatically and clearly that I am not a detail person. If you have a contract and it's important, I should not be the last one to look at it and sign off on it because I'll miss a lot of things. When I send out emails and text messages, it's riddled with misspellings and the wrong words and I do voice to text and I don't read it before I hit send. It's just a mess, right? <laughs> I'm not, I am not the person I'm good at building things. I'm good yeah. at creating processes and putting them in place. Mm -hmm. I'm not great at maintaining them. It's just not my strength. So yeah. I have to surround myself with highly detailed, meticulous people. Mm -hmm. And so I build teams of meticulous, detailed, smart people. I build, I create, they maintain, they improve. And that's really how I build all my businesses. I'm, I have a lending business that I don't have to spend much time in either. I still underwrite the majority of the loans, but that's a very easy process for me. But the actual processing of the loan, the paperwork, the phone calls, talking to the title company, getting this stuff, I don't, I don't do that. So, yeah, well, yeah, that's a great realization teams. to know that about yourself. And when you are working with people uh, that are using your coaching services, do you encourage them to find that out about themselves and do those 100%. assessments? Okay. Yeah. Anybody who works in my coaching program, I am going to have them take a, a personality assessment because the reality is not only does it tell you the person taking the test sort of what you're good at and what you're not, and you can have a little bit of self-awareness, but it really helps. So, uh, personality assessments are really great in the hiring and managing process too, because mm -hmm. if you're managing someone, you really should know how they're wired, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if I'm managing someone who requires a lot of detail in their training, I'm not the best person to, to manage them or to train them. I, I can't really do that very effectively. So I need to know who I'm talking to. So in my coaching program, I want to know who I'm talking to. I want to know who I'm coaching. How are you, how do you hear information? How do you take action or not? Like what are your strengths and weaknesses around some of those things? And I'll be a much better mentor and coach to you if I understand kind of how you're wired under the hood. Oh, that's fascinating. So of all the things you do, and of course there are many, in business other than your family, which I know you love tucking them in and reading stories and talking, but of all the different hats you wear as far as a uh, lending company or coaching or many other things that you do, what is your favorite? What is the most fulfilling to you? Um, I mean, if, other than family, cause that's the most fulfilling and it's a little bit of a cliche obvious, but I, it's just the truth. Like that's just what I want to do. Um, other than that, I, I love watching movies. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of movies and, and I think for me, just because they're entertaining, but also I, I do have a lot going on in my head and movies, I'll, I can compartmentalize pretty well. So when I'm watching a movie, I can really kind of forget everything else that's going on and let my brain just mm -hmm. sort of relax and enjoy something. Sure. I like that. Um, I'm a huge cooking on the grill fan, I'm a big fan of that, like kind of obsessive a little bit. I just nice. bought a new, uh, a new flat top uh griddle uh, mm -hmm. like a hibachi kind of a griddle and uh i'm all about it i watch i watch cooking videos i probably watch an hour of cooking cooking videos a day i, wow. I just absolutely love it it's, it's just so much fun for me so oh, that's, that's sort so of how cool. i unwind on a personal level yeah 
That's funny because I always wondered what's the fun in cooking because then you have to clean up. I, I just don't get it, but it's so nice to surround yourself with someone or people that love to cook and try new recipes. I like yeah. to eat. My <laughs> wife's a big fan of my of my hobby too. She oh, loves I that bet. I'm all about it because I'm just like, all right, I got something. I'm going to try this. We got to try this. It's going to oh, be good. That would be so, perfect. Yeah. That's tons wonderful. of cooking. <laughs> well, Mike, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the Icons of Real Estate Show. I kind of went twists and turns in this interview, but I enjoyed it thoroughly and I hope you did too. I did. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Bye now. You're welcome. Bye-bye. 